Hello. Hello, Laura. And hello, Henry. Hi, Henry. Hi. Hi. Um, so last night I was at my friend Tom's birthday party and he's a very good amateur poet and he did a lovely poem uh, saying thank you to everyone who'd come to the party. Happy he's, birthday, Tom. But he's also a big newscast fan and an even bigger fan of Sunday with Laura Koonsberg. Even and happier so, birthday, yeah, so Tom. So I thought, why not combine all those things together and do a poem about this week's Sunday with Laura Koonsberg? Oh, my God. Here we go. Are you ready? <laughs> Eat your heart out, front row. White <laughs> Howard, double-barrelled chef on Sunday with Laura Kay. Politicians' exaggerations gonna get slayed. But first, there's breaking news. A picture of recovering Kate. But with all the Twitter gossip, did it come too late? Rachel Reeves bets all on economic growth. Vicky Atkins asked why NHS productivity sloweth. But wait, this weekend episode has no pad. Fear not, newscasters. You can always call up ad. <laughs> I think that's extremely good, Tom. And we all say, <laughs> one and all newscasters, happy birthday, Tom. I was going to try and think of something that rhymed, but I can't. So happy birthday. Adam, I think what we need is Tom for our next episode to rate your poem. OK. Or, or I'm just wondering, when, Henry, you'll know this. When when do they pick the next poet laureate? Is it like, <laughs> Ooh, does the person have to die? I, know or? Um, I think, aren't they on 10-year terms? Is that is that... And it's been Simon Armitage for a few years. I don't know. Or until they fall out with someone or say the wrong thing. It's so weird they... that we have we have term limits potentially for our poet laureate, but not our prime <laughs> minister. I mean, is the what's right that word? about? I don't actually know. I think know. we don't know. I don't think we don't know. We'll try and find out by the end of today's Sunday newscast. Newscast from the BBC. Hello, it's Laura in the studio. And it's Adam in the studio. And it's Henry at home. And Henry, what have you just found out? <laughs> I have just Googled <laughs> what I confidently asserted earlier, uh, which is how long people are poet laureate for. And the last two poet laureates, Andrew Motion and Carol Ann Duffy, did 10 years in the job, which would suggest that Adam will be free to become poet laureate, succeeding Simon Armitage in 2029. Also means it's a 10-year tenure. Boom. Oh. I think there's a secret poet in there as well, Laura. Oh. Right, what were you looking for in your interview with Rachel Reeves? Which, ah. let's remind people, was different this year because it came after the budget rather than before. Yes, it did. And we wanted to try to get her, really, to explain as much as she's possibly willing to, and maybe a little bit more, to the audience about what she would do if she's lucky enough to win the election with the Labour Party and move into number 11, although she was a bit coy about whether or not she'd actually move mm. into number 11. However, um, and I think, you know, Labour's in this tricky position, whereas for for Rachel Reeves' own economic and political beliefs, largely following the Tories' spending rules is the right thing to do. Now, she absolutely believes that for economic reasons and political ones, because voters often don't look at Labour and think, oh, they're not going to spend enough. Voters tend to look at Labour and think, oh, God, they're probably going to spend more. Mm. However, she has a problem politically, whereas on the left, a lot of people in the Labour Party say, hang on a minute, of course we should spend more because public services in some places are on their knees. There's also a different problem politically because some voters, including some we heard from on the show today, say, well, I look at both of you and you're kind of the same. So we were trying to get her to open up a bit more about some of the things that she wants to do, how close she really is to the Conservatives, and in the context of this week's budget, where the missing £2 billion that Jeremy Hunt nicked was going to come from. Look, the government made their announcements on Wednesday. It is now Sunday. And I think your viewers would want to know that I was doing the work properly, that I wasn't just plucking numbers out of the uh, air, but that I was methodically going through all the government documents to mm -hmm. identify the funding streams so that all my sums add up. And I think that if there's one thing that you and your viewers know about me is that everything in our manifesto will be fully costed and fully funded, including this pledge, and I will do the work properly, as I always do, to make sure that our sums add up. Henry, let's, let's sort of make sure our sums are adding up. So Jeremy Hunt stole the policy of changing the taxation of non-DOMs. So that's people who live in the UK but don't pay tax on their overseas earnings. So that disappeared. Plus spending government money to cut national insurance, because that's how tax cuts basically work arithmetically. That then adds up. To, that makes the black hole for Labour slightly bigger. What's your kind of back of the envelope calculation of how far down they are, Labour? It's a, it's a couple of billion pounds because the non-DOM tax uh, 
abolition, which Labour had said that they would do, but Jeremy Hunt has now got ahead of them and done, was specifically um, hypothecated, I think is the word, for particular policy. So Labour said that that was going to fund um, a host of policies to do with the NHS and also breakfast clubs in primary schools. And that costs, I think, roughly a couple of billion pounds on Labour's estimates. And that is a couple of billion pounds that they are going to have to raise elsewhere because they said very quickly after the budget that they're still committed to those spending plans. So, I mean, I look, I think Rachel Rees would have been politically negligent if she hadn't given at least a little bit of thought to what alternative ways they might raise the money if the government ended up going back on its previous policies and abolishing non-DOM tax. And what I thought was really interesting in her interview with Lauren in that clip we just heard is that she's almost trying to make a virtue of the fact that she won't tell us. She's saying, look, you know me, I'm methodical. I'm going to go through this slowly. She's trying to say that the fact that Labour haven't very quickly said, okay, this is how we'll fund it instead, is itself a sign of her fiscal prudence and fiscal responsibility. I think that's quite an interesting kind of comms manoeuvre that she's trying to pull off. I suspect what actually lies beneath it is that they worry that if they come out now and say, this is how we're going to fund it instead, and if the general election doesn't take place until after the next fiscal event, after an autumn statement in October, say, you know, the fear might be that the Conservatives would nick that revenue raiser as well <laughs> yeah. and leave them having to find a third way to pay for all of this. And we are in this sort of weird limbo, actually, I think, for both parties, whereas they don't want to put too much out into the public domain. Labour, because they're worried about the Tories nicking it, and they also don't particularly want there to be the kind of mental levels of scrutiny that there will be in an election campaign. They don't want that right now. Mm. Similarly for the Tories, you know, it's like dangling this NI oh, actually, we're going to get rid of national insurance over the course of the parliament. And you saw Rishi Sunak, I was going to say, doubling down on that in an interview with the Sunday Times today. But, you know, we we are still, in political terms, still miles off from actually getting into the manifestos. But the parties have to say more, but they don't really, they don't want to give us the whole story yet. So we're in this slightly weird sort of limbo period, which is one of the reasons why when we tried to press Rachel Reeves today, I, I think quite rightly, would, would she admit if they win the election that there won't be lots of extra money for public services, but not just that, that some bits of government would actually see real terms cuts. I tried very hard to get her oh, to yeah. confirm that today. She did She did tacitly say yes in code. Let's have a listen. Well, at the moment, the government have not set out their plans by individual departments, so we haven't got a spending review. I will do a spending review uh, quickly when I, uh, if we win the uh, election, but that's not something that's possible to do from opposition. But I do know that public services need more money. That's why we will make that initial injection. But remember also, the Office of Budget Responsibilities forecasts are based on the government's plans, mm -hmm. and the government's plans do not include our comprehensive plan to grow the economy. OK, Laura, there's a lot going on yeah, there. there I've never heard that bit now three times. I still couldn't fully do the decoding. So <laughs> yeah. you do it for me. So I think if you put that together with something she said later on, she said, we won't be able to do things as quickly as we want to. And it might be slower than I'd like or some, some, something like that. I'm sort of paraphrasing. But what, so, so she sort of tacitly said, yeah, in mm. some bits of government, it might be eye-wateringly tight. What she's also saying is true, is that she doesn't know and we don't know exactly what the numbers are going to look like by the time of a general election. Let's hope for everyone's sake, actually, the economy is looking a bit perkier than it is now. But what was what we were supposed, what we were trying to drive at is what her instinct is. As and when growth turns up, what's her instinct? To give you, you and everybody listening a bit more back and to keep more of their own cash? Or is it to put money as soon as they can into public services. And yes, there is a little bit that they've earmarked going out. And of course, actually, it's a huge amount of money, 1.7 billion or whatever it is. It's a lot of cash. But in the context of a government budget, it is a, a rounding error, yeah. I think people, would, the Treasury would say. So we were trying to sort of get to her instincts. And I think she did tacitly say today, yes, the first year, if we win, might be absolutely uh, horrific. But to sweeten the pill, there'll be a cash injection. So but top to up somewhere. To sweeten the pill, there'll be top up somewhere. And my instinct is actually as soon as I possibly can to put more money into public services. But Henry, you might disagree because when you're watching at home and listen, you, you know, you get to people, different people take different things. Well, one thing, one thing that I think is certainly um, uh, a little bit um, over optimistic in what Rachel Reeves said there was 
oh, well, the OBR don't factor in at this stage, Labour's plans to grow the economy. Therefore, you know, things might be slightly more generous than, than they look at the moment. I mean, I think even on Labour's own terms, their plans to grow the economy, which mean uh, which entail reform of various public services and particularly reform of the planning system. You know, that That is not going to bear fruit, even if you're extremely optimistic about it. That's not going to bear fruit for several years. So I don't think that affects the early years of the public spending envelope that Labour have available. I mean, I think for that reason, one thing, I don't know if this is the same for you guys, one thing that increasingly crops up when I speak to Labour people about the plausible scenario in which they're in government by the end of the year is they say, you know, they're going to be really unpopular. That's what Labour people fear very early on, because a lot yeah. of people will have voted for them, hoping, thinking that things will very quickly feel different. And actually, because of a combination of the circumstances which they will inherit, but also, of course, Labour's own choices about how to respond to the circumstances they inherit, they think that for a while, perhaps a period of years mm. after their potentially getting into government, things would still feel pretty similar to how they feel at the moment especially or including in those crucial public services. But that's so interesting, though, because uh, my ears really picked up when Rachel Rees started talking about Tony Blair and education, yeah, education, yeah. education, because I'm now old enough to remember a time when his name was banned from being mentioned by yeah, pro- pro- yeah, Labour yeah. politicians. Yeah. And I wondered, is that her trying to create a bit of hope and recapture, mm-hmm. recapture a bit of nostalgic, op- sort of like reverse old optimism? I think that's right. Yeah. And because, Laura, in your piece that you wrote for the website, mm. her mentor was Alistair Darling, that's right. who gave her three pieces of advice. And the third piece of advice was always leave people with a bit of hope Mm -hmm. but actually if your colleagues are then also saying to you hang on we're going to be really unpopular because we're going to do hard things then it must be a really hard balancing act to know how much hope to offer I think it's really I think it's a really 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 difficult set of circumstances both economically and politically how do you make voters feel excited about what Labour might offer when you know that there's not much in the tin when you rattle it around and of course politics is not all about promising spending money there's a lot of focus at the moment across the political spectrum about how you spend public money better. Nobody listening to this would think that money is absolutely the only answer. And yet it is, of course, a big part of political promises. And this is not going to be a checkbook election. You know, we're, we've all covered and newscasters will all remember elections. A whereas, well, <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> well, when people say we're going to spend 400 gazillion yeah. million pounds on giving everybody free something or we're going to spend 20 bazillion pounds on making all children be happy or whatever. This is not going to be that kind of election where people are. It's a competition of big checks, which for certain people would be uh, electronic bank transfers will not compare to each other. Mm. The other thing I was thinking about, though, which older newscasters will remember too, perhaps, as I do, is Gordon Brown's miserly decision to give, was it 75p on the pension? Per week, yeah. Just after they had taken office. And how that, even for a government that had a massive majority, felt that they had a sort of surge in enthusiasm, that went down like a cup of sick. And that, when you were talking about that, Henry, that made me just think of that moment. And I think they are sort of prepared for that, right? And also also they know there's this sort of anti-politics mood out there at the moment. How do you make anybody believe that a politician might have any answers? Although I have to say, actually, our programme inbox and my inbox had actually quite a lot of positive messages coming straight in about Rachel Reeves sounding competent, sounding like she was a breath of fresh air, Maybe it was her friends and family. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but it's but interesting, it's interesting. Talk, talking about Rachel Reeves and friends and family. Thanks to your piece mm. this week on the website, we're learning more about her as a person. Mm. And there's the two anecdotes that really stick out <laughs> for me. There's the going up to her grands and Kettering. Yeah. Also signalling Middle Britain. You don't get much more Absolutely. Middle England than yeah. Kettering. No offence to people in Kettering, it's a lovely no. place. Um, and collecting the 20p's from all her relatives that she was dragged around. And then her sister splurging them all in the toy shop and Rachel Reeves saving <laughs> them up for a rainy day. And then the other thing about her going this charm offensive in the city. And we've all been to events where like there's far too much catering and like loads of pastries that no one's ever going to eat. And so she asks permission from her host if she can put them in her handbag and take them back to her office. I know. Well, as she said, we asked her about it on the telly and good on her she would say technically she lent into that story and she said well that's what you'll get with Rachel Reeves as a chancellor no a free waste <laughs> no, it's, it's exactly. interesting that the, the yeah. focus on Rachel Reeves as a person she's been in politics for yeah. longer than Keir Starmer and in yeah. many ways is a much more political person mm-hmm. um, you know she uh, was involved in the Labour Party at university she's been an MP since 2010 but 
she um she really had a proper long wilderness period i mean it was alluded to by michael howard on your panel laura mm. who said that unlike keir starmer she refused to serve under jeremy corbyn and that's true and she was um you know she had been a fairly prominent member of Ed Miliband's shadow cabinet. Uh, but when they lost in 2015, she retreated to the back benches. She was chair of the business select committee, did some work on outsourcing on the collapse of Carillion, if mm -hmm. you remember that. But, you know, it's sort of what you call in newspapers, back of the book stuff. You know, it was, it was stuff on sort of page 23. You might see a Rachel Reeves quote. And, and she hadn't really worked with Keir Starmer. Mm -hmm. And I, I've asked people before, what was the, you know, when did Keir Starmer decide that he wanted her to be a shadow chancellor? Because they hadn't really worked together. No one really seems to know, but yeah. he at some point decided that, I mean, she wasn't his initial shadow chancellor, by the way, although I think he might have wanted her to be, but mm. she, he, he at some point decided that she was the person who he wanted alongside her. And, and Keir Starmer doesn't have a long sort of lineage of economic thought in no. the way that some leaders of political parties do. So she really is you know, setting the tempo and the parameters for this potential Labour government. And, and that makes her such a central and important figure. And at least for now, she has absolutely won the argument in the Shadow Cabinet that you do not promise a single penny. You know, when I talked to lots of her colleagues this week, it was absolutely like, yeah, we have understood this message. Mm. We all get it. Lots of us want more money for projects that we would like to say that we would do if we win the election, but we all get it. She has won that argument. I also remember when she got the job, it was just after Labour had been absolutely dumped in the Hartlepool by-election, which was a very perilous moment for Keir Starmer. Yeah, existential, we, we read. And he apparently, according to Tom Baldwin, even thought about quitting at that point, his biographer. Rachel Reeves was actually brought in to bolster Starmer's credibility. You know, it was almost like she was sort of the one doing, not doing him a favour because it was obviously her dream job. And for years, it sort of felt inevitable that she mm. was going to be, everybody thought, oh, well, she'll probably be the Shadow Chancellor. And if Labour is ever in power again, she would be the likely person that's sort of, you know, near the front of the queue for that job. Um, but it is interesting thinking about her politics because she's that very rare beast in Westminster she really doesn't seem to yet have any enemies. And she's quite self-deprecating. She's got a very good sense of humour. We saw a bit of that today. Mm. She's well-liked and well-respected. But some people are also very interesting on how good at small-p politics is. She understands what colleagues care about. She's very good at apparently, you know, dropping the odd little text here and there, making people feel that they've been understood. Now, her friends say that's because she's a good person. She's a decent person. Some of the conversations I had, there was also a little bit of scepticism, not saying that that was artificial, but just actually that's part of being a very canny politician is making sure that nobody's any doubt about what you think, but you make other people feel as if they've been listened and understood. And if you're decent to them, mm. they don't then mind if you're really tough, right? So you can get away with being hard and being well-respected if you are also extremely courteous, thoughtful and all the rest without making enemies. Let's see if that survives this first exactly. spent in 2025. <laughs> exactly. Because, I mean, that is, I mean, I guess the thing for a chancellor is that a spending review is technically done by the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, so you can load some of the political pain off onto them. But you know, it is one thing saying to your colleagues in government, uh, in opposition, look, we need to be cautious, we need to hold the purse strings tight for political reasons as well as economic reasons. But when you get into government, mm -hmm. I think some of those cabinet ministers as they then would be rather than shadow cabinet ministers mm. um, will start to chafe at it a little bit more. I can see a world in which Rachel Reeves, uh, obviously we're getting well ahead of ourselves here, but I can see a world in which she tries to, if she does indeed move into number 11, move across to number 10 afterwards. And one of our, the friends I spoke to for this piece this week did say that they believe very much that she did have that higher ambition, but it is not what drives her right now. Now, I've never asked her about it. I don't know, but that is definitely a view. And, and, and I think, you know, She's clearly someone who many people in Labour circles and I think also in Conservative circles believe is, you know, is likely to be one of the most sort of significant political figures of their generation, which is why, you know, we spoke to her at great length this morning and why, you know, the, the, we wrote a big piece about her yesterday because focus groups say people don't really know anything about her, but she is somebody who we're all going to learn much more about in the next few years. 
But also, we say, might about Victoria Atkins. Well, I was just going to so, say, yeah. last, last word, I'm going to have the last word on Rachel Reeves. <laughs> he says, he said, I mean, as a guest here on Sunday. I was going to say, um, fine. But we're in a bizarre <laughs> political situation where you've got the Labour shadow chancellor saying there's going to potentially be quite big spending cuts in some government departments when I'm in charge. Oh, but I'm in favour of cutting the tax that people pay when they sell their second homes. Yeah. I mean, that's going to annoy a lot of people on the left of our party. Welcome to like, 2024, exactly. everybody. Looking glass, looking glass. I should write a poem about that. Maybe you can. <laughs> yes. Anyway, Laura, introduce us to Victoria Atkins. So Victoria Atkins is the health secretary. She's not been the health secretary for very long, but she's also actually a bit like Rachel Reeves, although she's come into politics later. She's part of the sort of, you know, coming generation of people who are probably going to be around for quite a long time. She's got a safe seat. She's probably going to be around. Uh, and she's, you know, ambitious and is already in a big job as health secretary. And she uses the NHS all the time. She uses the NHS. <laughs> all the time. Did she tell you she uses she's the NHS? She's mentioned it a few times. <laughs> well, she's got a stick. I mean, look, if you are the health secretary at the moment in a post-pandemic world where you've got absolutely appalling waiting lists in England, same in Scotland and Wales, frankly, but different people are in charge of it in, in those parts of our country, same in Northern Ireland. But she has a sticky wicket and her uh, hope, and she got some money out of the Chancellor in the budget, is if you spend three or four billion pounds on productivity, basically getting more bang for your buck by having better IT and better technology, that we'll start to see improvements in the health service quite quickly. What's hard for her is that so many newscasters know bits of the NHS are sort of crumbling. There's all sorts of problems with buildings. Fax machines are still used. Hospital IT can be absolutely terrible. And she's sort of now, I think Henry like ministers are in several government departments, I don't want to say desperately, that seems very unkind, but frantically trying to make some good in what time they've got left before the election. And it's that kind of, I wouldn't say frenzy, that's sort of unfair, but, you know, there is that kind of, really? You're going to do this now? I think it's all, I think it of a piece with the budget this week where Jeremy Hunt, the sort of broader argument he was making, straddling all the specific policies, was trying to um, argue that, the country has turned or is turning a corner. And I think that's probably what cabinet ministers like Victoria Atkins in public service departments are trying to do as well, because it it, it would be absurd for them to pretend that everything's hunky-dory. But if they can say, look, these are things that are happening soon and they're a sign that things are getting better and they're a sign that the hard years weren't wasted uh, or, you know, stick to the plan, as they would put it. Um, I think that's kind of... Um, the fairly delicate political argument that the that people like Victoria Atkins, or I guess Gillian Keegan's another example, mm. the Department for Education, uh, are trying to make. And um, if they can pull it off, then perhaps they can claw back some public support because always worth remembering the Tories poll rating is not bad at the moment. It is dire, historically dire. But the risk is that people just think the the sort of rhetoric and um, language they use is just so absurdly at odds with their experience of public services. I think that's the thing that is really tricky, and when or, or the reality of the you know the NHS still has fax machines, and she's sitting saying, "Well, the potential for AI is amazing." And you know, uh, how how do those two things stack up in the same conversation? I love reminiscing about the NHS and social care levy because do you remember that was when I was a day to day political journalist as I well. Do. And do you remember yeah. Laura, you and I spending hours phoning people mm. when there was a sort of like auction going on in government about how big the increase should be, and some people were like, "It should be." one percentage point and then Sajid Javid was like it should be three percentage yeah. points and then it's like day by day it just went up a bit down a bit up a bit down a bit up a bit mm -hmm. down a bit and then the last minute they finally agreed to do it and it wasn't just an idea like they passed legislation oh, to make did. it happen yeah they did As, but George Osborne passed, le passed legislation to do it before in the, in the Donut reforms Andrew Donut an expert in this field who's very cross that nobody's basically done it and this is not a new issue it's not a new problem and it's not going to go away just because our politicians don't want to crack it. Anyway, we've talked about it a lot. We've been mm. down memory lane. We've been talking for a long time. We've talked about Rachel Reeves a lot. We've talked a bit about Victoria Atkins. Both people I'm sure we'll talk about more. But tonight, lots of people will be talking about the Oscars. But you'll have a double helping of newscasters. Yeah, so Extra Oscar stay up. excitement tomorrow. So I'm going to stay up all night, watch the Oscars. And then me and Katie Razzle, she's going to be in her Razzle hotel Dazzle. room in LA. Fabulous. Uh, and we're going to do a special episode of Newscast, which will be streamed on the iPlayer at 7 a.m. Oh, wow. And then available as a podcast. And then there'll be a normal classic daily newscast in the evening. And I'll just be 
sleep deprived. Amazing. What wonderful tasty morsels you are offering up for our wonderful newscasters. It's been wonderful having you with us this weekend. Yeah, thanks for really having fun. me. Oh, also on Oscars, if you've seen any of the Oscar nominated films and you want to send us a little review, whether mm. it's Anatomy of a Fall or Oppenheimer or Barbie or whatever, newscast at bbc.co.uk or WhatsApp us on 0330-123-9480. That's probably Knuff. Uh, see what I did there. Uh, it's been lovely having you come back another time, but me and Paddy will be back next weekend. Addy will be, Adam will be here twice tomorrow yes. with the wonderful Dazzling Katie Razzle from LA. Henry, always wonderful to have you with us. Great to be with you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC. BBC.